All right, welcome everyone. Welcome amazing panelists and my friend board and out there in Facebook land to our September Women in Film TST, the second Tuesday event. We've been doing these live since April, uh, virtual, virtual live, and uh, with our committee and our lovely host, Abby Ekenezer, welcome. We've got three incredible writers, screenwriters here, four incredible screenwriters um, from our community. And I want to first thank all of our sponsors and community partners, including IOTSE Local 48 and Ann Miller Insurance and Bad Animals, Seattle Film Institute, Clatter and Din, Kerner Cameras. We all know Kerner Cameras. and. Um, I also want to say that this is our 30th year for women in film as a nonprofit organization. We're community and membership driven, and we currently have a special going on our membership. It's 50% off. And one of our perks is our roster for our professional level members, which is a huge deal at 50% off. And also because women in film Seattle, the headquarters in Seattle is a member of the National Women in Film US. As a member of Good Standing, you also have a national roster that you can list yourself on. So um, that's an amazing perk. So just want to put that out there. And we also appreciate donations of any size since we've been doing our virtuals. We've not been. Um, charging and we which we usually do for our TST events a small fee and it's very small but we would appreciate any donations that you'd like to make and there's a PayPal button on our web page of our main site and from there I will pass it off to my friend Abby and our four incredible panelists thank you everyone and thank you women in film board the end have a good time <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so excited uh, to get a chance to talk to all of you today. My name is Abby Ekenezer. Uh, I just wanted to also give a little blurb um, that right now, uh, there is currently a 50% deal for women in film members with Cascadia Film Festival. So. If you're interested in submitting your project to that film festival, and if you're a Women in Film member, um, there's currently a 50% off deal that's going on for that. So look for the Women in Film um, uh, Facebook page and newsletter to get more information on that. Uh, I would love to talk, um, I'm so excited that we are getting a chance to do this panel uh, specifically because of the, you know, diversity and representation that is currently blooming in the Pacific Northwest right now. So um, I'm going to let my panelists introduce themselves and we will get right into the panel. Uh, I will start first with Nicole. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, I am Nicole Pouchette and I'm a writer, director, and producer uh, based here in Seattle. Um, I write for a show called Strowlers, which is produced by Zombie Orpheus Entertainment. And the whole point of that show, for me at least, is to use fantasy to talk about social commentary. Um, so there's a lot more that goes into it. Everybody can play uh, in terms of writing and adding stories to it. But my whole thing is using film, using art to get into social um, commentary and speak about what's going on in life and what's going on in the world. Um, I use sci-fi, fantasy, um, and horror to do that. My horror short um, won Best Film at the Seattle Black Film Festival this year, so I'm really proud of that. And um, it premiered at SIF last year, and I've got another short that's making the rounds right now called Such an Honor. So lots of good things happening. That's <laughs> uh, next up, DJ. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I'm DJ Walker. Uh, I'm a Seattle-based uh, writer, director, producer, actor. Uh, I like to just say filmmaker, keep it simple. Um, yeah, uh, my most recent project, uh, Our Troll, has been going around the festival circuit. Uh, it'll be at the local sightings uh, festivals 
in about two weeks. Also, it's available via PBS right now. Uh, also, special shout out to the folks at Langston for that situation. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's good for now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, DJ. Uh, our other panelist today is Jamil. Um, please introduce yourself, Jamil. Yes, thank you for having me. My name is Jamil Suleiman. I am a rapper, writer, um, performer, filmmaker, um, comedian, I don't know, whatever. I'm pretty much whatever is paying that day. No, I, I am a filmmaker. I kind of want to echo what DJ said is that in the end, it's all about film for me as my passion. Uh, I co-own Indie Genius Media located in South Seattle. Um, with my creative partner, Aaron Jacob, he's the DP. Um, and uh, we both kind of uh, operate the company. We do a lot of video based in the community. So we do a lot of video um, narrative stuff, um, docu-narrative mostly for community causes, food banks to community farms. Right now we're really working on BIPOC food, uh, food security, food sustainability. Um, but my passion is writing uh, for television and film. It's my goal. Uh, I won the 2019 um, Seattle Film Summit Pitch Contest, um, which Nicole was one of my judges. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, good times, Curry in a hurry. So my hope is to really use my experience, my cultural identity as a South Asian Muslim um, to, and as a hip hop artist too, to really just add another distinct voice to the choir. Um, and I love comedy and parody and satire. I think that's one of the most effective ways to make social change in, in my, at least in my experience. So just happy to be here with you all and to join you. Thank you so much, Jamil. Um, Zola, who is from LinkedIn Hughes, uh, please give a little uh, narrative about yourself. Hi, I'm Zola Mumford. I'm the curator of the Seattle Black Film Festival, and that is produced by Langston, a performing arts organization, which um, if you've been in Seattle for a while, you may have known us for the previous nearly 20 years. We started in 2003 as the Langston Hughes African American Film Festival. And um, although we's all, we have always had a global reach in acquiring films and doing our call for work, we did do a name change last year. So um, just to reflect some of the structural changes. So same festival, familiar people, and same commitment to supporting independent filmmakers and to the best of our ability. I'm also a research and reference librarian and a past board member of the Clarion West Science Fiction Writing Workshop. And it was interesting how as we were doing our, I mean, I should also say that, um, of course, we showed Wretch and we showed Troll. And I was really excited to see more science fiction slash speculative fiction in our call for work entries. I've put together many packages in the past few years, but um, if we're talking about representation of all POC, we need to be in the future. <laughs> so I'm old enough to have seen the first Star Wars in a theater, and I loved it, but I wanted to see some black people in the future. <laughs> and I wanted to see some people of color in the future because if anybody's got tenacity, I think it's us, yeah? <laughs> and we want to collaborate. So um, I should let's get into the discussion. I'm not a screenwriter, but I um, do spend a lot of time working with texts, evaluating texts, um, and I'd be happy to say a few things about what we might be looking for. I've also been a film juror for other festivals. Thank you so much for that, Zola. Um, so can I say that like when we were thinking of the idea for our next um, TST, uh, Nicole and I had talked about this and we've been talking about this for a while just because uh, it was it was brought up on another panel that I was a part of 
um, about how there seems to be a lack of diversity in Pacific Northwest films, right? Uh, the content that is coming out of the Pacific Northwest, especially being a part of an organization that is so about representation. And, and so, you know, this panel specifically is just so important because uh, I know that there's so many other, uh, you know, diverse screenwriters that are out there. Uh, I feel like, you know, now that um, inclusion is so important in, in the things that we create, uh, you know, bringing all of you guys who are just well versed in the, in the world of screenwriting, uh, it's just, it's so important to me and I'm pretty sure it's very important to most of our viewers. So um, I kind of wanted to do like a, a Q&A with all of you, um, just to, you know, gouge some of the experiences that you guys have been dealing with and then also to talk about you know opportunities that are currently in Washington right now specifically you know for those who are trying to get into the screenwriting world uh, so one of my first questions is um, have you ever felt overwhelmed when it came to being a writer of color um, and then the second part of that is what about now and and how has that changed exactly for you and I would love for any of the panelists to, to answer this question. Uh, you know, I think it, it's, it's interesting, um, especially, particularly now, uh, because, you know, uh, at least for me, being a person, you know, being black right now, uh, period, is a little stressful right now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, a bit more than usual. Uh, as, a, as a writer, you know, for for me and probably for a lot of you guys, uh, you know, it's a it's an outlet, it's an extension. So during these struggling times, uh, it's it's been good. I've had people reach out uh, about script doctoring services right now and like um, wanting to get more diversity in the door. Um, but yeah, overall, overall right now, yeah, it's stressful. <laughs> it's, and it's exhausting, uh, very exhausting, so. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Um, I know for me in the past, being a, a writer of color, it's been harder to get my foot in the door, um, obviously. Uh, I, I think it's obvious. Um, you know, I, whatever I write, either I write something with people of color as the main characters, and I hear from the major people that they can't sell it, and so they don't. They would love it to be some uh, someone else. Um, if I write someone and I don't specify that it's going to be a person of color, and I end up with a white lead, then sometimes it's harder to um, use the resources that I have for me in the black community. So it's kind of a catch-22 sometimes, or it used to be at least, it could be a catch-22 of what, what I chose to write and how I chose to, how I chose to try to either take advantage of the system as it was or, or just write what I want. And it's taken me a long time to finally get to the point where I'm just going to write whatever the hell I want and it lands where it lands. Um, but that, it, it's been overwhelming in, you know, years past. And now it's kind of overwhelming for a completely different reason where people want to collaborate and it feels like the only reason they want some of these people want to collaborate is because I'm black and they need a black voice. So I don't mean to be negative, but that can be, it, it can be kind of off-putting because it's like, okay, well, I've been here this whole time. Um, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting feeling right now. So. If I could, um, uh, Nicole, I don't think that's necessarily being negative. I think it's an acknowledgement. I mean, obviously your talent is always there, but um, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of um, in the early days of our festival, um, we brought in James Spooner, the director of Afropunk, and he jokingly referred to February. Um, we have our festival of April, was July this year because of COVID, but we used to do it in February. And, Soon realized everybody else did their black stuff in February. And I remember him jokingly referring to February as National Negro Employment Month. Like, 
you know, we're available to write and uh, to collaborate, uh, to freelance, do things all year round. So why not weave it into your year long slate of projects, right? Audiences are not only looking for certain types of content at certain times of year, or if they were, why don't we change that? And then, yeah, I'll never be grateful for a, pa a pandemic, but um, being unable to connect to people face to face does mean I've managed to find out about other writers who are doing really interesting things or attend virtual um, readings or meetings online. It's a little bit tough to attend previously. Um, Jamil, what about you? Have you ever had, um, like, what are your thoughts on, on what's going now, going on now as a writer of color? And do you feel that has changed for you in the current market? Yeah, so I think um, as just, a, so I'm new to filmmaking proper, like actually writing scripts and doing it, like dedicating to filmmaking. So, um, so my experience in that world is pretty new. I'd say maybe two or three years tops, maybe three. Um, but I've been making art way for my whole life. And I think being like my identity in particular is very peculiar in a way, you know, my, my parents are immigrants, they're South Asian, we're Muslim. And just that alone, even without adding America on top is complicated. So when you're in the States, what I've what I learned as a young person was no one's going to give me any shot, so I might as well just make whatever I want, and and so I'm a di I'm a I'm a total DIY artist in that way where it's just like I don't expect anybody to pick this up. So when the internet kind of came along and I was able to just put stuff out and and things might have caught, I was like, oh, there's an audience for this. And I think like when we're working with the industry that we're working in, whether it be film or music or entertainment in general, um, you know, there's, there's so many gatekeepers and there's this whole system of, of things that I just wasn't willing to, I wasn't really willing to try and tackle or combat or whatever. So I just did my own thing. And as a, as my own, as my own artist in this kind of interesting world of the internet and whatnot, like the attention came my way. So I didn't have to go to the industry, so to speak. However, the interesting thing about it is that you, we are in this very unique moment in time where all of a sudden they want us, right? They, they, they want us like all the time. Um, people of color, you know, whether it be black, indigenous, people of color voices, they just, now it's like, yeah, we need it. And, and it definitely feels like um, we're being commodified and exotified and, and in a way used. Um, but at the same time, I do see a lot of openings that I've never seen before. Um, so I think it's, it's like pros and cons of a, of a fastly transforming moment, intersection, intersectioning moment in time in American history that has left with the, and, and yeah, the internet, and all of a sudden we're on the phone and everybody in the world can see this, this, for example. So like we have such a unique moment to express ourselves. And I think the industry is for, is forced to adapt to it. And one of those things is, is representation because we're 95% of the planet, <laughs> non-white people, people of color. So um, I'm eager to see how it works. I'm also cautious and keeping my eyes open on how industry works and knowing that um, there is something called multicultural white supremacy, right? Where we get used um, for the cause of white power. And I'm not trying to fall into that, um, into that game. So trying to keep my eyes on the prize, but also looking at the opportunities as well, as much as I can. That actually runs into my next question. And Nicole, you hit on it a, a bit too. Um, have you ever felt that you were being tokenized when it came to making a production more diverse? um oh yeah uh still so, uh you know i edit um i work camera department you know i went to film school so i've i get in where i fit in a lot of the time um and uh from the production side 
a lot. Um, <laughs> um, and you know, it, it's tiptoed around a bit. Um, and also, you know, uh, like I'm not really trying to cast a super negative light about it because, you know, I want to eat <laughs> as we all do. Um, as a writer, you know, I feel like when it comes to respecting my creativity as an artist and uh, an idea guy, essentially, uh, I feel like the, the, the doors aren't as open, you know, um, in, the re in that realm. Um, I, I personally, for me, like kind of what Jamil is saying is, you know, uh, when it comes to creating my own opportunities, um, most of like, you know, I do a lot of script doctoring uh, for my company and uh, like as a producer, you know, building up a lot of projects from the ground up uh, with first time. And those opportunities have came from within the community, you know, um, and a lot of probably my biggest gigs and biggest opportunities have came from uh, other black people or other people of color uh, reaching out, reaching, you know, across rather than, you know, some of the people at the larger companies like Microsoft or Amazon, you know, reaching down, you know, to be like, hey, well, you know, what the, what you got, you know, where mostly they're like, eh, we, we'll just cast the black people and call it good, you know? Um, so there's a lot of tokenization, you know? Uh, I think the most important thing is our presence being there. And at first until, you know, we get a strong foothold, we're gonna to be tokens for a bit. That is what it is, so. Yeah, I, I mean, on top of that too, like, um, I know Nicole knows that, you know, it's very important to try and make sure that, you know, when you're doing productions, you're making them more, diverse. I know anytime I try to do a production, I try to make it as representative of me, you know, as I possibly can. And, um, you know, Nicole and I are actually working, working on a, a feature uh, next year where, you know, I mean, that's exactly what we're trying to do. So um, I would love to hear from Nicole uh, about that question too, if you've ever felt um, tokenized when it comes to productions. I gotta say that there's, um... For me, the biggest problem is being confused and not knowing whether people are contacting me because they really want my work or because it's we they need someone black to write something or someone of color. Um, so, and I don't know if it makes a difference is the interesting thing about it because ultimately if I wanna work, I'm gonna work. Um, and if I don't, I'm not going to. So that's what it really comes down to is just, I'm good. If, I, if this is a project I wanna do, I'm gonna do it. Um, but yeah, it, I know that you and I had, Abby, you and I had a conversation earlier this summer trying to figure out like, is this a problem? Is this something that we should think about when we know fully well that we are only being asked to do a thing because because yeah. of the color um and you, and i think that also i mean besides me wanting to eat besides me wanting a job there's also the fact that nothing will change unless people start doing this mm -hmm. um so we have to have people just flat out say i'm gonna hire this person because she's of color um she's a person of color she's I'm, I'm going to hire this person because of that. Um, and until we have enough people doing that, um, like I think was already said to some degree, then we, we're, it's, we're not going to have any change anyway. So um, I think that in these next years, hopefully it's not too long, but uh, we're just going to have to be um, tokenized and put up with it and go <laughs> get, get in there and pull up people, pull people in there and get more people in so that we are, um, so we are looking at um, more people that don't have to be tokenized. Um, because the truth of the matter is, um, we might be tokenized, but we're damn good to be able to get up there in the first place. Um, yeah. So I, I kind of have decided, I've let it go, because no matter what, there are, it's not like there's only like two of us out there. There's a whole lot of people of color not getting jobs. 
And if we got one, even if we happen to be tokenized because of it, we're getting in there with a lot of mediocre people. And so yeah. it says nothing bad about us. So just gonna go for it. Preach. Jamil. <laughs> yeah, I agree with Nicole. Um, oh, yeah. it sometimes, I, I mean, there's no easy answer to that question, I think. Um, it's a foot in the door. It may be tokenization, but it may be a foot in the door for you and then in turn someone else. The only time I feel bothered is when I'm asked to do a significant amount of work and no fee is offered and then I find out somebody else was offered payment to do the same thing. Yeah, that's that's not okay. Yeah. Uh, Jamil? Yeah. Um... I saw there's a question in there. I'll maybe get to that later, but yeah, um, yeah I think, I think so. <laughs> I don't know how to even start this one. I, my thing is like, yes, I've been tokenized. Yes. Yes. I continue to be tokenized. I guess I've been tokenized so much. I'm numb to it. And mm. to the point where I just do not care anymore about creating other people's content. That's really where I'm at right now. Where I'm just like, I'm not going to act in your script. I'm not, I'm gonna act in my script and I'm gonna go get it funded. And if it looks whack because I don't have enough money, then I don't really care because I made what I wanna make. So I feel like very, I think because of my history of being, you know, tokenized and or just straight up racism, right? Um, especially against Muslim Americans, post 9-11, but even way before 9-11, 9-11 wasn't like the time when all of a sudden people started hating Muslims. They, we, they never really liked Muslims here. So there's there's always been like this, I've always felt outcasted from the mainstream or the industry anyways. So to me, I was just like, you know what? I'm gonna make what I wanna make. And as luck would kind of have it, the industry is turning more in that lane where I feel like independent DIY creatives are able to um, spread their message and, and, and share their story. And that's changing the industry in a lot of ways because now the industry is going to the internet to look at the algorithms of what people are watching and they're realizing, oh wow, not even white people wanna see white people all the time, right? And, and also on top of that, younger white folks who are maybe our generation or even younger or a little bit older, they're they're kind of tired of seeing white people all the time too. Even them, they're just like, okay, like, you know, how much mayonnaise can you put on a sandwich? So I think as far as, um, as far as what we can, what I, what I see myself doing, it's like, okay, I might as well just create my own thing. And as it's kind of evolved, more of the kind of industry attention has come in the direction of, DIYers. I mean, I, I hate to use the example of YouTubers, right? But before YouTubers, um, for example, Lily Singh, who's a very popular South Asian woman. Now she hosts a, a night night show, late night show on NBC. Um, she there was they were never going to allow a South Asian woman to have a late night show on M on NBC. She had to get ten or eleven or twelve million subscribers on her own doing video in her house, playing all the characters and all of this kind of stuff. So we're forced to do that. But the byproduct is that we're influencing the industry in a, in a very strong way where they're like, okay, we can't just avoid this anymore. Like they're, they're going to just create their own shit. And on top of that, they're getting more views than us now. So there, so I feel there's this very interesting jostling going on between independent creatives and the industry trying to, um, negotiate in a way how they're going to survive because if they don't adapt to the fact that their audience is changing what they're into and that their audience is actually changing <laughs> itself um they won't survive right and then and then all of a sudden you have an opportunity like a lily sing i don't know if you would have had the movie black panther getting the budget it would have had having it all having it be such a black-led film if it wasn't for um DIY creatives before that who set the tone to, uh, to to kind of let the industry know like hey you can actually put in money in this kind of stuff and make a lot of money and it made like a, a billion dollars or something like that 
So I don't know what, I don't know if that helps to answer your question, but I think like things are changing rapidly and we're, we're a lot more of the reason why it's changing than it's, than we've been before, for sure. Um, and then you had a question, Jamil, from the audience um, yes. about how you find a specific audience for uh, online, you know, for your right. art. Um, that's a very, very good question. So I, so I think hashtags, I'm sorry, I know that sounds kind of, kind of crazy, but hashtags work. Um, people do search hashtags, but I think, I think having, um, human beings, literal human beings in your local community to support you is huge. So they help to launch you. I'll give you an example. Curry in a Hurry, the music video that we did, um, a friend of my speculation and I made a song together and did a music video. Um, and it was all organic. It's like a Beacon Hill classic, you know, like in Beacon and like the CD South End Cap Hill, like people know that song. Outside of that area, not as much, but that group of people helped to spread it online to the point where I got a call maybe a year or two after that song came out and someone hit me up and there's like, there's a high school full of South Asian kids in Brooklyn who are singing your song in the hallway. And I'm like, that's, that's, for, you know, almost damn near cried. Cause I was like, I was that kid, but I didn't have that song. Right. So I feel like the, the audience, when you make content, that's a niche con type of content, the audience will come. It'll, the audience will follow what they want. So that song about food brought a lot of foodies. Um, it was an eater, for example. So like eater put that song out because it was about food. So I think like the content itself is always niche to an audience that will find it. And, and that's what you're trying to do online is you're combining audiences, right? So with Curry in a Hurry, I brought people who listen to hip hop, South Asian folks and foodies and all of a sudden you have like a, a, a niche, a, a unique niche audience that is into that, right? And then it can go into these, those other audiences. So I think that the way you make your content, put your content out online really forms your audience. And then they inform you on what they want you to do next. So it's a really interesting kind of like give and take. Um, so I want to just leave, give some comments until I go before I go into the next question. But um, Jacqueline, oh, sorry, um, so Sophia Perez said, thank you so much for touching on the commodification of BIPOC and pandering to this particular moment. Uh, I think it is and has always been up to us to make our own opportunities without gatekeepers being a part of the equation. And then Maria said that when uh, Juilliard started having blind auditions, the admittance of women skyrocketed. And she's often wondered or she's often wished that we would have blind writing gigs where your gender, color, age, ethnic background um, were all unknown. And it's all just about the writing, um, how to make that happen. Of course, that doesn't solve the problem. Um, and a lot of producers uh, being indifferent to having the main character be a person of color. But um, that kind of follows into the next question that I had. Uh, uh, so this is from a producer. And she was wondering, what was what is the best way for producers who are looking for content to be able to solicit or access scripts? Um, and I would love to hear from Nicole, especially being a part of the um, Northwest Screenwriters Guild. Um, that's a very good question. I know that there's, um, you know, on a global scale, there's the blacklist that's. Um, made by Franklin Leonard, um, where you can go and you can, as a producer, you can go and search for scripts that people submit. And as a writer, you can pay money to submit your script and have it posted. So that's one way of finding like a treasure trove of, of scripts um, as a producer. But I also think that that's something that the Northwest Screenwriters Guild needs to start doing as well. And I say that as the, um, the, the VP of the board of the Northwest Screenwriters Guild, so I'm not just throwing something at them, um, but I think we need to start doing that as well um, to actually serve that as a, as a purpose for the community um, to be able to, for, for that to happen. So I don't know of any other place that's doing it locally of just having these are scripts that are available, like a list of a log line and things like that. Would people be interested in that kind of thing? 
Yeah. I'd be interested. I was about to say, you know, where can I put my email on here? You guys just reach out to me. I got you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. I love the idea of a, of a blind um, writing thing. I, yeah, I, th I think that would, <clears throat> that would be profound, honestly. I think I would be like, really change a lot of people's thinking about things. Yeah, um, I mean, you do know that we have programs coming up, right? Like the Seattle Film Summit, Jamil, you know about that already, Nicole also. Uh, and that's going to be in November for three weeks. Um, and it's full of content pretty much almost every single day. You know, I know that um, Women in Film will have a couple of panels along with, um, you know, some of the other creatives and organizations right here in Washington. So, you know, if you're able to um, get involved in that, you know, they're still doing the script challenge uh, and, and stuff. And uh, there's we just found out on Film Freeway that there are a ton of film festivals that are looking for scripts right now. So um, that is going to lead into another question. <laughs> um, but do you know of any opportunities for POC writers that already exist? Well, I can say that I think that for one of the reasons why I've been wanting to do a panel like this for more than a year is because I think that the one of the biggest challenges is that a lot of screenwriters don't know what exists regardless of whether it's for um, for people of color or not. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a challenge. So I can talk to what's out there overall. And I think that people need to get up out there and start taking advantage of those things. Like, um, as you mentioned, the Seattle Film Summit, um, there is a pitch fest a pitch contest every year where people can just submit some um, some writing go in there pitch their stuff to people get 30 seconds in front of a judge they vote and then send you to the next round and you can end up in front of um in front of all kinds of managers and agents and people who actually can move things for you if you actually just go out there and try um i know that people that some of those managers have said even like, why do you have the same people, the same kind of people and the same people year after year? I'm seeing the same people. I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I would like to reach out to people, but I don't know what to do. And I swear, Jamil, you asked me if I remember you. I was so freaking happy to see you. That, <laughs> that's like was the highlight of my day. I was like, oh, it's, it's someone of color. Um, but there are lots of opportunities out there if people, one, um, look for them, but also we need to reach out more, which is part of what the point of this is. So there's um, Seattle Film Summit with, that you mentioned that has the pitch contest. Um, we have table reads through there where you can also get in, get your, your stuff read in front of people. Um, my script, and I don't know how valuable that is, but it's a thing. You know, at least you're getting your work out there, at least you're getting some feedback. Um, there's the green room which is a contest, an annual contest that um, allows people to submit their writing and get yearly, like regular feedback for a whole year from managers and agents from Hollywood. Um, there's all kinds of different opportunities through the Northwest Screen, um, Screenwriters Guild. And then there's opportunities through other organizations as well. And I'm gonna shut up and let other people talk too. Sorry. I wanna say uh, thank you. Uh, Cause for me personally, you know, uh, I'm constantly doing like competitions I find through the internet that are, I don't really know where they're based. It's just, you know, they got some money and I'm putting my name in and putting my pitches in. Uh, but locally, I, I was unaware of that. And so I, I thank you for that. And um, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm gonna say there is also another initiative um, that was just brought to my attention, actually. Uh, it's called, um, uh, oh boy, I, oh, the Amplify Initiative. And it is a mini fest that is free specifically for BIPOC to enter. And if anyone wants to get any more information in regards to this, uh, you can contact cinemadrifter at gmail.com. That's cinemadrifter, one word at gmail.com. Uh, that, uh, that was just recently started uh, and 
you know, it's not, it's, it's here in the, the person is local here in the Pacific Northwest. So you can definitely, um, you know, email that email address and, uh, you know, submit your scripts uh, or submit your films and, or at least just get a little bit more information on what all of that entails. And um, I would love to go into another question. If I know Jamil has to leave soon, so uh, I'd like to get a quick question uh, for him, uh, for him to answer first and then everyone else can. But um, let's see here. Uh, what opportunities do you think uh, should exist right now for writers of color? And can you provide any suggestions? Wow, that's a big, what should, should be here? Yeah. Um, <laughs> man. What are you seeing that are allowed, or, you know, that, that, you know, writers of color don't really get to have access to compared I, to our counterparts. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think we get, I still don't think we get shit for access. I, I really don't. I mean, it's, um, I think things are slowly changing, maybe faster than they have, but that doesn't mean that it's, it's quick enough. I, I think, um, it's really tough to say because with streaming and, and the internet and everything else as factors, the industry is being disrupted by like all sides, right? So um, not only is there social justice issues and representation, there's streaming issues and there's like big entities dying off, <clears throat> excuse me, big entities dying off. Television is a question mark these days and, and all of that. So um, I don't, it seems that things are changing so much on such a fundamental level on such a foundational level that I can't say that I can't say that this model is going to give us what we need. I think at this point, we're just going to have to evolve into something completely different. And, and as we do, we'll, we'll, we should, we should be right. Bringing up everybody in that. And I don't think there's any way of getting around that now because uh, we all have the access now. Well, you know, we all have the abilities at least to prove ourselves um, in a platform and in, in a medium where, particularly online, where you can't really deny that. I'll give you an example. We, we, I was, um, I was assistant producer on a show called Turning Tables that uh, aired on Visit Seattle a couple, two, three years ago. And we were getting, uh, you know, art, you, you, you pitch, you, you, uh, put a chef and an artist together and they do like a little 20, 30 minute episode and it aired on revolt. And I was talking to some people and revolt is owned by puff daddy, um, P diddy, whatever he's calling himself these days. Um, and puffy, there's a, there, someone from revolt showed me a video of puffy talking to his producers and he's screaming his head off at him. And he's like, why am I paying you all all this money? when this kid down the street with a cell phone just got 30 million views. So why am I paying you half a quarter million dollars a year to fly around, act like you're cool from set to set on a show no one even cares about anymore. So I think like things are changing so quick that, that we, and, and I think people of color are the catalyst of this change. You know, I mean, go ahead and look at TikTok and tell me where the cultural trend is going. I don't see people acting more like white folks on TikTok, you know, if anything, I'm seeing like this bizarre, almost like explosion of expression of all sorts of kinds of people from all over the world um, that is just completely changing our social conditioning of how we see people, right? So I'll see, for example, the one white guy I did see on TikTok was like five, six, and he's doing like 360 dunks. And I'm just like, how, you know, how is that? I would never see that on television. Right. Like, I don't even know if they would have scouted and found that man. Um, and then I'm seeing on the, on the same TikTok, I'm seeing South Asian kids who are living in squalor in India or in Pakistan. And they're going viral, you know, lip syncing to, you know, Miley Cyrus or whatever. And all of a sudden they're viral and they're and now Indian YouTube is putting them on. So there's this so much going on. Um, that I don't know if there's a should as much as there is 
that is happening right now. I just don't know where it's going to end up happening. I think the industry is going to have to pick us up and change their tune or they're going to lose their audience, which is their money. Um, and then on top of that, you have the, the, you have the idea that creatives are now their own curators. So if I start my own channel and put out my own short films on YouTube, I can do a Patreon account. I can get them paid for on GoFundMe. I can sell some merch. I can shout you out. And I can do this all without Warner Brothers, blah, 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 until the point where Warner Brothers sees me and is like, wow, this guy gets like three, five million views every time he puts a short movie out. You know, so I think like there's there's all of this change going on. I couldn't tell you where it's heading, but I feel like we are a much bigger factor than we ever have been. And I'm hoping that changes the culture that we live in as well. Thank you, Jamil, so much for joining us. I know you have to go. I do. Um, I'm sorry, but the lighting is going anyway. So we missed yeah. a little, little <laughs> golden hour. Slowly. You saw that, right? Yeah. Filmmakers out there. It's cinematic. <laughs> it's cinematic, man. It's cinematic. Thank you um, so much, uh, everyone, yes. for having me. And uh, I can't wait to just continue to build with all of you, specifically BIPOC people in film in Seattle and Pacific Northwest. Um, I'm excited to work with all of you. So much love. <laughs> Thank you, Jamil. Thank you again. Peace. Bye. Um, so yeah, for for anyone else, what do you feel are the um, challenges, you know, that we are currently still have, you know, still having to deal with, uh, that, you know, I mean, like, what is a way that you can feel that that you feel that we could probably bridge some of the challenges that we're facing, or you know, get more opportunities? specifically for, um, you know, uh, people of color that are writers? Uh, you know, I, there's a sentiment that I, I definitely want to echo to, you know, uh, upcoming writers here that are watching this and stuff. Uh, like my, my mentality has been that, you know, the, the cavalry isn't coming. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, by the time, it, in where we're at you know by the time people are reaching out you're better off on your own continuing doing what you're doing um but you know in an ideal world i i, I would really like to see more uh mentorships and just uh even People knowing where, like, to seek representation, where to actually reach out and uh, to go through those next steps of your career. Um, if you're someone who, you know, doesn't want to have to create all your own content and all that, if you just want to write and, you know, do that, because I know that was me for a while, you know. Um, I wish there was more opportunities like that for mentorship and, and, you know, even just like, hey, submit here, you know, to this, to this talent company, you know, and anything like that would be a step further than we're at, so. Well, I know the Langston has an opportunity for kids, right, who are budding filmmakers. Um, Zola, yeah. did you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, over the past uh, year and a half or so, so it's, it's been a really valuable partnership with the Seattle International Film Festival, Fifth Crash. Um, so I didn't direct this program so much myself. Um, it was uh, it was really directed by um, two amazing young producers, Mayusa and Ali, who are unfortunately moving to Oakland <laughs> and won't be doing it in Seattle. but um, they worked with kids who are really elementary school age and they have great ideas. They're very creative. Sif Crash was, uh, we worked with Dustin over at Seattle International Film Festival and that program was really intended to diversify their own youth programs. It was a good partnership. 
being able to work with a larger organization that has the infrastructure and the um, ability to get the cameras in the kids' hands. Um, we do what we can, but we work with a small budget. Um, Langston's a wonderful organization, hardworking people, but you know, back to this, we're not big. And so community partnerships have always, through the history of the film festival, been a really important thing. And the um, short films that young people put together in Sith Crash, um, we included those in a special package screening. And sometimes, you know, they're, they're really short. They're two and a half minutes, three minutes long. But we also, when we had to go fully online, because of the pandemic this year, we did um, also include time in our schedule to have the young people Sith Crash film. It's important to let an 11 year old or um, an, a nine year old know that their hard work is valued. And um, as DJ was saying, mentorship is absolutely essential someone who can work with you patiently one-on-one -on -one. Um, and you're talking about, oh, what is a storyboard? And, and a lot of it is stuff that I think kids are doing already. Um, Jamil was saying um, that you really do see amazing things on you know, TikTok and YouTube. Um, and I have certainly spoken with filmmakers, past guests to the Seattle Black Film Festival, Langston Film Festival, who said, oh, I, well, I didn't go to film school. I watched a lot of really good movies. You know, and maybe some people are going to learn um, narrative structure by watching a lot of documentaries or um, if that's what they're trying to do. Um, there are ways to teach yourself, but it's really hard to do this kind of work in a vacuum because ultimately you need to be thinking about how am I going to relate to an audience? And I really think that's where mentorship comes in. Um, every year at our festival, we have what we call a filmmaker's round table. Sometimes we've done it as a huge brunch where we have this giant southern breakfast and just ask people to be on a panel, filmmakers to be on a panel and just talk. And people in the audience comes and all kinds of people are there. And we, you know, it's up to them how many industry things they want to talk about. Of course, we do things like workshops um, as well. But we also give the filmmakers time to just get together for a private meeting. And when we can, we try to invite local filmmakers to that. And that's all word of mouth. So yeah, um, some of the things that Nicole was talking about before, connecting people, um, the connections are, are really important because there's no one list. People are moving in and out of Seattle all the time. And just get the filmmakers together and the people talk to each other and figure out how they can help each other. The mentorship can happen in so many different ways. Um, and you never know how it's going to turn out for someone. I, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, we know that in the early 70s, for example, um, with black exploitation, I mean, sure, I have mixed feelings about that genre for various reasons, but people were getting hands on experience as um, David Walker, um, one of our past guests and historian of that genre. Um, found through interviews that they were learning how to do sound, they were learning how to run lights, working on these films. Because they finally were in a production network where they could get jobs. Um, and Octavia Butler, um, she had uh, some kind of TV and in, uh, screenwriting internship in the early 70s. And it wasn't really what she wanted to do, but it was there. And so she took it. And obviously, she went off in a wonderful, completely different direction. But I think you have to be intentional about it. And so, yes, it's valuable when um, um, organizations, um, local and national, are intentional about trying to bring a lot of people in. Black public media, um, they've done a lot of great um, face-to-face -face intensive workshops. Um, they probably have shifted a lot of what they're doing online now. Um, any opportunity like that, I think, makes a huge difference. 
Yeah, um, I know that um, I posed this question to Nicole before too. So I would love to get um, any uh, response on you knowing, especially with the Screenwriters Guild, you know, if they're giving any opportunities for screenwriters, um, for, you know, for people who want to, to be screenwriters or screenwriters of color right now, or if you feel there are specific opportunities that should be given for uh, writers of color? Um, we've had table reads um, that were only for um, screenwriters of color to submit to, um, where we have nights full of people being able to hear their script out loud. Um, we've done that, but I think there's a whole lot more that we can do. And part of this for me is to really get more ideas for how to reach out and how to get more people involved. Um, one of the things that I think that really helps in terms of a screenwriter getting out there is, um, you know, particularly in a, in a place like, like Seattle, um, you can't, well, you can just sit and write and that'd be the only thing that you do, but you might not get very far. Um, you might not get your work out there very much. And um, I hesitate to say volunteer because people don't have, always have time for that. But getting involved with organizations um, allows you to get your foot in the door and allows you to meet a lot more people like volunteering with um, with Langston volunteering with the screenwriters guild I know the screenwriters guild needs a lot of help and the weird thing about it is that you can volunteer and end up talking to any number of managers or agents and having that screenwriters guild name behind you saying hey um, I'm just calling up because we need to we, we want to have a, an event and you could literally pick any agent that you want and call them up and say and, and introduce yourself as the committee of the Northwest Screenwriters Guild and start a relationship with these people. Um, there's lots of opportunities like that that exist at organizations all over Seattle. I would think I would think that you can pick your place and volunteer for a committee and get your and be able to reach out to people very, very easily. And, and I want to say that knowing that there, it's a time commitment that's that's a big load sometimes. Um, but I think that keeping those boundaries and saying, okay, this is what I can do, allows you to get to be able to make those connections while still keeping your sanity. So I don't know if I answered your question, but that's just one of the things <laughs> that I think that people can do in well, order to um, get ahead. I definitely think it, it helps, especially for those people who are starting out, right? Um, and it kind of goes into a question that uh, we had from, you know, one of the people who are watching, um, Eva, asked, how do I start writing a script? I'm a beginner. Uh, do you have local or online classes to suggest? Um, I have a book to suggest. <laughs> um, uh, save the cat. cat. Um, <laughs> great, it's a great book. Uh, I'm also like, uh, you know, one of my favorite things personally to talk about is the process of writing. Cause that's something that, you know, I've, I've been writing since I could pick up a pen. So, uh, it's something that evolves and what works for some doesn't always work for others. Um, I also, I guess I, I, I know, don't, can't speak for anyone else on the panel, but those are the kind of questions I always love to answer. Um, I get emails and DMs about that stuff all the time. And it, it's, it's fun, and, uh, but there's also books. Um, like I said, Save the Cat uh, was one of my favorites. Even uh, I think in like middle school, I started with uh, screenwriting for dummies. Helped me write my first one, <laughs> so you know. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely remember screenwriting for dummies. <laughs> um, I think I started with that myself. Um, I know for me, at least, when it came to screenwriting, you know, I asked some of my favorite writers. Uh, one of them being Nicole. <laughs> uh, I mean, actually the only one being Nicole, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, anytime I had an idea 
the first person I would talk to is literally Nicole. Like, I have an idea for this script and I want to write it, but I don't know how to, you know, what do I need to do? And, and that's literally what kind of launched me, you know, into screenwriting uh, three or so some odd years ago. Uh, you know, besides the fact that there's, there's software out there now, right, to help. I swear by Writer Duet. Um, because it is this beautiful online collaborative software where you can literally see, you know, if, if you're working with someone, um, you can literally see all the changes that they're making. They can see all the changes that you're making. You guys can literally talk while you're making the changes at the same time. Uh, I had issues with Final Draft because you kind of had to like give someone permission in order to go and make changes and you couldn't do anything until they gave you permission back, which kind of stops the flow <laughs> you know if you guys are just like I have an idea let me you know what about this what if, what if she says this or you know what if he says this or you know what if they're digging up bones or, or something like that right um so I don't I don't I know that um I do have like one friend that I know um that teaches at Bellevue College I believe and it's uh Jonathan Lovett and he teaches a screenwriting class um specifically uh, but I think it would just literally be, you know, looking at film schools, uh, you know, different uh, film schools that are out there in the Pacific Northwest. I'm pretty sure that there are screenwriting classes, you know, that are out there. Or, you know, if you feel comfortable um, with, with asking a screenwriter that you know to, you know, talk to you a little bit about it, then, then there's that. Or join the um, Northwest Screenwriters Guild. I think that would help a lot especially because there are so many people there that could help be mentors you know for those who want to get into screenwriting and actually like steer you in a in a good direction to go to um i will i i have another question here um that and it, it's uh no name but it's can you ask each panelist for outlets where we can disseminate information about any opportunities Well, I know that the Northwest Screenwriters Guild actually keeps a calendar um, where we will put a lot of our classes and we put other things on here too, um, as far as um, classes and opportunities for screenwriters. So um, get in touch. I think that that's one place. We also uh, have classes too, just so I can say that. I know someone also said Bird by Bird is a good book for writing. And then Brian McDonald, who is a, a, a person of color, um, has one called Invisible Ink. Uh, and then uh, Northwest Screenwriters Guild, um, on their website, they have a link that is for events uh, dash calendar. So, you know, if you want to look at some of the screenwriting events that are involved there, uh, you can definitely sign up through there. Uh, I, I have one more question before I let you guys go because um, you know we're, we're gonna be wrapping things up here unless any of the audience you know have any more questions but um, this one was from another producer is there a clearinghouse that has script synopses and writer names for scripts that are available for pickup none can you repeat that? Sure. <laughs> Is there a clearinghouse that has script synopses and writer names for scripts that are available for pickup? So is there like an, uh, a specific um, area, area, right, where producers can go and look at scripts um, that are available for them to like do something with? Yeah, like a... a, a I mean, I, I guess I would think like the Seattle Film Summit, you know, when they do like the Bigfoot uh, screen challenge. Um, but I'm wondering if there are any other places that we don't have to wait until November or producers have to wait until November in order to get access to scripts. Globally, I know there's the blacklist. Um, yeah. So the, the, the blacklist is a fee, right? There is a fee. Well, I don't know if there's a fee for producers or not. I know there's a fee for writers to post their scripts. Yeah. And it's, it's like thirty dollars, I think. Or yeah, something like that. twenty-five a month, which I feel like is just it, <sighs> a lot. <Yeah. laughs> that's, that's, that's a lot. It's a lot, <laughs> but it's there. 
so that's there. And then, um, yeah, we were thinking about possibly doing something with the Screen Owners Guild as well. That doesn't exist, but that maybe should. Yeah, I know Women in Film is going to have programs available here soon too. So I'm um, definitely be on the lookout for the Women in Film page for that, hopefully. Um, DJ, do you know any um, places where you like submit scripts or have uh, a plethora of scripts where other people might submit? Um, uh, yeah, no, mostly drawing a blank, the, a little too much on the self produce I keep getting <laughs> my scripts, but, um, but yeah, uh, it's, that's, a, that's a tough one. Um, I feel like that's the world that we live in right now, though, right? Is, yeah. is if we want to create stories, especially if we want to create our own stories, we just have to create them and not yeah. wait for someone else to do it. Exactly. I know there uh, a few years back there was like a sort of a system within Amazon, like that they were doing like an Amazon Studio thing. They uh, were years ago. Yeah, that's like uh, that's absolutely yeah. That's all I got. Um, you know, <laughs> they're it, not doing that anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would definitely encourage, like you know, if you're a producer looking for, you know uh a script if you're lo local there's there's people to reach out to you know um and like the northwest film forum yes like a solid yeah. one um and but outside of that i don't think there's anything specialized for that um you know or you can commission a local writer hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that I actually got the opportunity to work with, um, thanks to Nicole, uh, to work with another writer, and we actually were able to write a beautiful short script together, uh, and you know, that's what we're currently uh, casting a crew and, and actors for, um, you know, that we're trying to film end of October, and, you know, it, it was it was great because you know, it was, it was literally her writing the voices of the, of, you know, the, the white people that were involved in the script and, and me writing for the characters of color, you know, and, and you can see where the, there's a difference in the writing because, you know, uh, this person I was writing with, she's a scientist also. So you could see where all the like scientific intricacies and words were said and, you know, where um, there's this fear mongering that comes from you know, living as uh, an African-American or, you know, just a person of color in general in our world right now, right? Especially with the protests happening and um, brutality, <laughs> you know, and such. And so, uh, you know, I thought that was an amazing opportunity to be a part of. And I can't wait to see, you know, what kind of magic is actually brought on film itself. But um, so, uh, I want to ask the viewers that if you have any more suggestions um, to email the Women in Film Workshop Committee, um, especially if you're interested in joining the committee, uh, you know, just their email is on the Women in Film page, so super easy. Uh, and we would be welcome to all interested parties. If you have any ideas, please come and join our committee. Um, I feel like you know, maybe we should start our own collaborative, like, page where, you know, writers of color can submit, you know, their projects and have those seen by, you know, other producers and stuff like that. Because I feel like something like that is really important, especially now. I like it. Oh, uh, someone said, Jacqueline Ware said that the African American Writers Alliance is also a good resource um, for, for uh, people who are interested in looking um, at uh, scripts. And then um, for those who are interested in sub uh, submitting ideas um, to the committee, uh, WIF at womeninfilmseattle.org um, is a place where you can email your suggestions. So if, uh, I'm gonna see if, if um, our attendees <laughs> uh, have any more questions. 
Uh, and, you know, if our panelists actually have any more last closing thoughts that they would love to give to the people who have been watching you ever so silently. <laughs> Not to be creepy or anything. <laughs> uh, Zola? Um, use every resource available to you. Network, network, network. Be generous with your time, um, but also have some boundaries with your own time. If you are doing a historical piece, please ask a librarian to <laughs> you to some good sources so that your stuff is accurate and it doesn't jar the audience out of a film that's supposed to be history and not alternate history. Um, our talk, the call for work for the Seattle Black Film Festival. Um, so anyone can submit a film. It just, you know, so the films um, have to be by or about Black people. We'll probably have our call for work open in uh, late November. LangstonSeattle.org. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, DJ. Uh, yeah, I just, you know, I want to encourage people just to, you know, writing, like I said, writing is, I think, very individual process. Um, I'm sure you could write, you could ask five writers about how they do it and you get five different answers. Um, so don't be afraid just to do it, you know, um, with screenwriting, there's, you know, formatting. Outside of that, it's, you know, it's writing. So it's your expression. And um, just do it because you're not, you can't wait on an opportunity because, you know, if you hold your breath for that, you're going to pass out. So yeah. uh, just, just get to it. Um, and the process in itself is the journey and love all of it so that's it uh and nicole um i would reiterate um networking but also networking through volunteering and getting involved with things so that you can really show who you are and because people don't just hire talent they also hire people they like so I think that's a very important thing to do is get out there and have people like you. Yeah, network, network, network is absolutely mm -hmm. important. Um, Can I have one random question? Sure. Which might actually, n uh, never mind. Yes, question, please question. <laughs> okay, Zola, did you know Octavia Butler? I met her exactly one time, and it was shortly before her death. Um, it was, she had just published Fledgling, and I, um, yeah, we had a nice short conversation. I had hoped I would see her again, and I didn't. I know several other people who were close friends with her, and she was, she was, not she was a nice woman. <laughs> I mean, she was, kind and supportive of other writers and just um, did it all very quietly and um, actually recently lost a friend um, who used to drive Octavia Butler around because she didn't drive. She would be on Metro just like with, with the rest of us, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, she would, they got to be friends and she would just be driving her around Seattle. And I didn't know that until she, my friend passed. Okay. So I'm hoping they're meeting up again. Yes. Thank you. I just, it's been, I've been wondering this whole time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I mean, you know, funny you, you talk about um, Octavia Butler because Nicole and I um, are actually the feature that we're doing next year and that we're trying to induct DJ because DJ knows that I sent him a message about this. Um, and I'm still waiting to hear back from DJ. <laughs> um, but, you know, <laughs> we enlisted, uh, we're, we're trying to enlist eight different writers uh, to be involved in this project. And it's all works that have an influence of speculative fiction in the world of Octavia Butler. 
um, I got a chance to actually meet someone who is a friend of hers, uh, Nisi Shawl, yeah. who is here in uh, Wash. Here's here in Seattle too. We met at an event in uh, March, early March, right before the pandemic had happened, and um, you know, she literally said, "She's like, I love that you're doing this because it needs to be done." finally give that woman her due <laughs> um and you know if you ever need any help or you know anyone to talk to just send me a message i got you girl and i was just like oh <laughs> you know and she told me about the community that she had of aspiring writers um and you know how she would help try to mentor you know some of them to just to be elevated, right? To, you know, try to give them some kind of opportunity. So still waiting for DJ, not, not trying to call him out or anything like that, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we had- If I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. I would love to see someone make films from Nisi Shaw's short stories and um, novels as, as well. Um, she's really an amazing voice and she's also been, encouraging it you know me personally yeah there are a lot of she, she yeah, just started it, a writing it, program it is your thing there are so many amazing writers we have a writers um people of color writing amazing speculative fiction a lot of it is short stories if you're mm -hmm. thinking about your budget please get yourself in front of an, a speculative fiction anthology start reading those stories contact the writers start talking to them there is so much opportunity really yeah yeah I, I i know that nisi just started a class yeah. here specifically about writing speculative fiction too um i forgot the name of the program but you know i'm pretty sure if you just google nisi shawl you'll you'll find that the name of the program that she's doing and that was just recent like a couple of days ago that she had talked about that on facebook so um i i, I don't think we have any more questions um any last words nicole not <laughs> okay well you know i'm gonna close this out with uh, just having an absolute appreciation for all of you thank you so much for joining me on this this very important and beautiful panel i'm so fortunate that women in film and langston uh, Hughes Seattle and Northwest Screenwriters Guild were allowed to to join together in this wonderful partnership and I, I hope that we get to have more. Um, thank you so much DJ for for joining us um, in Absolutely. your amazing knowledge, uh, especially because you're such a, a great source. I remember meeting you at the stiff and uh, seeing our troll and, and just literally right away, there was that instant, like instant um, connection. Uh, and then Nicole, I mean, <laughs> we had a connection at Doctor Who. <laughs> uh, and you know, Zola, I mean, you're just an inspiration and, and I just am so appreciative for you joining us uh, this evening. Uh, thank you again for all of those who were a part of, um, listening to us tonight. Please make sure you join us again next month for uh, November's uh, TST and, you know, stay tuned on the Women in Film uh, page uh, for more information on that. You know, get ready. The Seattle Film Summit will be happening in November, the first uh, three weekends. So, you know, I'll, I'll be on one of the panels for that too. So, you know, get ready. And, and for all of those who are interested in getting into screenwriting, um, or wanting to learn, reach out to the Northwest Screenwriters Guild. You know, they have amazing opportunities available for you, uh, especially if you have questions when it comes to being involved in screenwriting. Uh, I know I'm still learning. Everyone is still learning. There's so many tools that are out there that are available for you. So get in touch with them uh, so they can give you access to all of that. Thank you again for joining us and you all have a great, wonderful evening. Thank you.